Okay, fantastic. Okay, greetings everybody for, that's joining us. Um, you're here for the NOAA AML Physical Oceanography Division virtual seminar series. Our speaker is Dr. Dennis Volkoff, and he will be speaking about inferring Florida current volume transport from satellite altimetry. Um, if you could please keep your microphones muted and type your questions in the chat window. When Dennis finishes his presentation, we'll ask your questions um, at the end of his presentation. So with that, I'll pass the microphone over to Dennis. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining this uh, AML Physical Oceanography Division seminar. I am Denis Volkov, a scientist at NOAA ML and at the University of Miami Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies. And today I'm going to present a recently published study on inferring Florida current volume transport from satellite altimetry. Uh, this work uh, was done in collaboration with several colleagues uh, from my department who are listed in this slide. So the Florida current is the name given to the Gulf Stream as it passes uh, through the Straits of Florida. And it has the mean volume transport of about 32 sphere groups. And it is one of the three western boundary currents in the subtropical North Atlantic. The other two are the upper ocean uh, northward flowing Antilles current and the southward flowing deep western boundary current. And both are found along the continental shelf break just to the east of uh, the Bahamas. So these currents are regularly monitored by uh, NOAA AML scientists within the framework of the NOAA Western Boundary Time Series project. So why is it important to monitor these currents? Well, firstly, because these three currents account for the bulk of the upper and lower limbs of the meridional returning circulation, or MOC. And the variations of MOC have been reported to have significant impacts on weather, climate, regional sea levels, and ecosystems. Furthermore, uh, measurements of the Florida current represent one of the key components of the MOC observing array at about 26.5 north, known as the rapid MOCA WBTS array. As you can see in this uh, time mean meridional velocity profile uh, here, and uh, the standard deviation of meridional velocity observed at 27 degrees north, the Florida current fills the Florida Straits essentially from coast to coast, with the strongest variability observed near Florida coast. And peak speeds in the Florida current can exceed two and a half meters per second. And just to give you a scale for the amount of water carried by the Florida current, so if you imagine that the largest in Florida Lake Okeechobee is drained, then it would be possible to fill it with the Florida current in just under three minutes. And the largest in Earth freshwater lakes, the, the, the Great Lakes and Lake Baikal, would be filled in about eight days. So to observe the Florida current, NOAA AML has used a retired submarine telephone cable that lies between Florida and the Bahamas. Uh, the voltage induced on the cable by charged particles in the sea water carried by the Florida current can be calibrated into transports using section volume transport data. And the section data uh, we collect consists of drop sonde and XBT data collected during uh, one day cruises on small fishing boats at 27 north and CTD ADCP uh, cruises on board the research vessel Wolfgang Smith and also during less frequent cruises on global class research vessels. So the cable records are daily and nearly continues since 1982. So as of today, the cable records constitute uh, the longest quasi-continuous uh, climate record of a boundary current in existence. And although the cable has been the most reliable and cost-effective measurement system for Florida current transport, efforts are underway to find a suitable backup or replacement system that would substitute the cable during inevitable future system failures or, for example, if the cable breaks or something. So one of the cable alternatives that has been investigated is the use of two pressure gauges deployed uh, near 12 
meter either bar from both sides of the Florida Straits at 27 north, shown by uh, yellow stars in this map. And another potential alternative which I'm presenting here is the use of a long track satellite altimetry measurements uh, from Topics Poseidon and JSON series of satellites. And the two ground tracks of these satellites um, are shown here by magenta dashed uh, lines. But before I start with satellite altimetry, I'd like first to make a few uh, remarks on the existing observations. So here you see the time series of the cable transport shown by the black curve and transport estimated from ship sections are shown by colored uh, dots. So red dots are for the drop zone sections, blue for the LADCP sections, and green dots show uh, measurements uh, for, from all the Pegasus floats. So while the record is quasi-continuous, uh, gaps due to instrument failures as well as logistics and uh, operational issues constitute about 10% of the cable record. For example, the longest gap occurred in 1998 uh, until 2000, when the cable was retired from telecommunication services. Another relatively long gap occurred in 2004, when hurricanes damaged the building in which the recording system was housed. And the latest uh, one month long gap happened in July 2019 uh, due to a voltage surge that damaged the recording system in the Bahamas. It should also be noted that the quality of cable data is not homogeneous over time. In the upper plot here, uh, you, you can see the yearly root mean square differences between the cable transport and the transport estimates from drop zone. LADCP and Pegasus sections, and the lower plot shows uh, the number of section occupations per year. The table below shows root mean square differences for selected time intervals. So what can be seen here is that the largest root mean square differences are observed in the 90s, probably because of the noise on the cable that was in active use for telecommunication services, and also because drop zone accuracy was compromised by GPS dithering. In 2000-2004, the recording system had several issues and probably because of that, uh, the root mean square differences are not great during this time interval. But since 2005, the accuracy has improved with the RMS differences between the cable and drop zone going down to 1.5 spectrums. So keeping all this in mind, the next question I'd like to discuss is, can sea level be used as an indicator of the Florida current transport variability? So according to the geostrophic balance, an oceanic flow, especially a strong one as boundary currents, uh, co-evolves with a cross-stream sea level gradient. And it has been reported that sea level changes on either side of the Straits of Florida are representative of changes in the Florida current transport. So a stronger Florida current is associated with higher sea level on the Bahamas side and lower sea level on Florida East Coast and vice versa. It should be noted, however, that because sea level gradients are directly related to the surface geostrophic velocity, relating these gradients to the Florida current transport requires that the surface geostrophic velocity is a good predictor of velocity throughout the water column. Historically, sea level has been measured by coastal tide gauges. And in this picture, uh, you see a typical tide gauge in Virginia Key, Miami. And the scatter below uh, shows the relationship between sea level measured at this tide gauge and the Florida current transport measured by the cable. The correlation uh, between these uh, uh, variables is about minus 0.4. In earlier days, Moll and colleagues reported on a high correlation between the monthly uh, Florida current cable transport and tide gauge records at Miami and at, K, and at Cat K in the Bahamas. Uh, but their study period only uh, consisted of about, uh, so covered only about 1.5 years. But later, using longer daily time series, uh, they showed that sea level on the western side alone and sea level 
difference across the Florida Straits can explain at least 60% of the Florida current transport variance at the sub-seasonal time scales. So while uh, tight gauges provide uh, the longest sea level uh, records, their use for monitoring the Florida current transport is challenging, uh, mainly because of the limited availability of continuous records on the Bahamas uh, side. As I have mentioned earlier, in an attempt to find a suitable backup uh, observing system for the Florida current transport, NOAA AML has maintained two pressure gauges deployed in shallow waters uh, at 27 knots since 2004. Using uh, the first six years of the pressure gauge data, uh, Chris Minen and co-authors showed that the transports estimated from the pressure differences explain roughly 55% of the total cable transport variance. So their conclusion was that although the paired pressure gauges are better than nothing, um, they are not sufficient and potential utility of additional observations needs to be explored. So uh, when we can see the sea level as a predictor for the Florida current uh, transport, satellite altimetry is another platform that provides long-term sustained observations. And unlike coastal tide gauges or bottom pressure gauges, satellite altimetry yields the spatial structure of sea level variability, which lets us uh, select only those measurements that are better correlated with the Florida current transport. In this work, we used uh, a long track um, sea level anomalies from Topics Poseidon and Jason series of satellites. Uh, there are two tracks crossing the Florida Straits and the Florida current, the descending track uh, 178 and an ascending track uh, 243. Uh, the data are available from January uh, 1993 to present, and the last year of the record is a near real-time quality, uh, which is not as optimal as delayed time. Uh, the repeat period of topics by Sidon and JSON satellites is about 10 days, which means that satellite flies uh, and measures over the same location every 10 days. And the long track sampling interval is about 6.2 kilometers. And it takes about 80 seconds for the satellite to fly between uh, 25 and 29 degrees north, thus crossing the Florida current. So plot here uh, shows uh, the time mean sea level along the two tracks with plus minus uh, one standard deviation showing by shading. And you see that the maximum uh, variability of sea level is observed on either side of the Florida current jet uh, with standard deviations of about 10 centimeters. And it should be noted that track 243 doesn't completely cross the Florida current, but south of about 65.5, 26.5 north, south of this latitude, this track uh, lies pretty much along the Florida current jet. So because the repeat period of satellite, altimetry satellites used in this study is 10 days, synoptic uh, ocean variability with periods less than 20 days is inevitably missed by the altimeters. And this undersampling uh, by altimetry satellites may result in aliasing of high frequency variability into low frequencies. So to investigate how serious this issue can be for the existing record, the daily cable record was subsampled at 10 day intervals. And in this plot, you see the daily and the 10 day sampled cable records shown by the black and cyan curves respectively. Uh, the standard deviation of the subsampled record is 3.2 uh, sphere group switches only uh, slightly less than the standard deviation of the daily record. And the root mean square difference between the daily and 10 day sampled records is two sphere groups. Frequency spectra of the daily and 10 day sampled cable transport displayed in the right figure shows that at frequencies smaller than the Nyquist frequency, the spectra are very, very similar in terms of the signals and their power. Uh, this suggests that the potential aliasing of high frequency variability in the Florida current transport estimates using a long track altimetry data at 10 day sampling interval is probably small. Okay, so a diagram in the left shows the dependence of sea surface height along uh, track 178 on the cable transport and longitude. 
This diagram was constructed by sorting the long track C surface height profiles relative to the same day cable transport in ascending order. And as expected, C surface height gradient increases with increase in Florida current transport. Also, what you can see, the diagram shows uh, high sea levels along Florida coast, um, east coast during the low Florida current transport, and vice versa during uh, the high Florida current transport. So in principle, a diagram like this could, could be used as a lookup table to infer the Florida current volume transport for a given long track CCFS height profile. In reality, however, this method does not yet produce robust results. Uh, and th this is mainly because one transport value is usually associated with more than one type or shape of the cross stream CCFS height profile. And in addition, uh, the number of CCFS height profiles uh, for extreme transport values is either small or zero, as you can see in the other plot over here. And this increases uncertainties in the lookup table and complicates the robust reconstruction of extreme transport values. So therefore, uh, we used the more standard approach and looked at correlations between the cable transport and the long track sea level anomalies at both tracks. It should be noted that um, before computing correlations, the long track mean sea surface height in the Florida uh, straits was subtracted to remove the large scale signals not related to the Florida current transport. And these plots here show correlations uh, for the entire record uh, for 1993, 1998, and 2000, 2005, and for 2006, 2018 time intervals. So the, la the last one is for the time period when the quality of cable measurements was improved. So what you can see here is that significant correlations are observed to the west and to the east of the Florida current jet. As expected, the correlations are lower in 1993-1998 uh, and 2000-2005 time intervals, apparently reflecting the poorer accuracy of the cable data. Uh, because the accuracy of the delayed time altimetry data has remained stable. The best correlations are observed for the most recent time interval, and the absolute correlations obtained for track 178 are better than for track 243, which is probably because uh, track 243 does not fully cross uh, the Florida current, as I mentioned earlier. So therefore, uh, for the rest of the analysis, we uh, use sea level differences along track 178 only. And to compute the differences, we select two segments uh, with the largest correlations, the eastern segment between 79 and 79.5 west and the western segment between 80 and 80.5 west. So the obtained CCFS sky differences together with the cable transport during the days of uh, satellite overpasses for 2006-2018 time interval are showing in the upper plot. And below, I'm showing the scatter plots of cable transport versus uh, C surface height differences, and then versus a C surface height average over the western segment, average over the eastern segment. And this is the scatter plot between the C surface height uh, in the western segment and eastern segment. So what you can see that the correlation between C surface height differences and cable transport during this time interval is 0.75, which suggests that uh, C surface height can explain about two thirds of the variance in the 10 day sampled cable transport. Uh, there is a, so a four centimeter change in, in uh, C surface height difference is related to about one third of change in the Florida uh, current transport and changes over CCFS height average over the eastern and western segment of track 178 contribute equally to the correlation between the cable transport and uh, CCFS height differences. So finally, to calibrate CCFS height differences into the corresponding transport values, we use the 2008-2014 time period which is similar to the one that was used by Chris Minen and colleagues who analyzed pressure gauge records. 
The correlation between the cable transport and delta SSH uh, during that, this time interval is 0 0.79. And the cyan curve in this plot shows the altimetry derived Florida current volume transport, and the black curve shows the cable transport sample during the days of satellite overpasses. The agreement is pretty good. And uh, uh, the lower plot uh, here shows uh, a zoom in on the last um, three years, approximately three years. And the transport estimated from the delayed time altimetry data is shown by the red curve, while uh, the magenta curve shows the transport estimated from the near real time data. So you see that these transports reasonably match the cable transport shown by uh, the black curve. So correlations between the cable and altimetry derived transport for the entire record and for different time intervals are shown in this uh, table. And these correlations are consistent uh, with uh, inhomogeneous cable data quality with lower correlations in the 90s and 2000-2005, uh, uh, and then better correlations starting from 2006. So it should be uh, noted that there is no significant reduction in correlation for the near real-time altimetry data. And this is probably because we use averaging over long track segments. And this means that the Florida current transport estimates can successfully be obtained in near real-time, actually a day after a satellite overpass. So next, we need to estimate the accuracy of the altimetry-derived transports. Before we do that, let's review the accuracy of the cable transports. Um, the cable accuracy was obtained by comparing cable transports to independent section transport derived from drop sound and LEDCP measurements. Back in 2014, uh, Garcia and Maynard showed that the measurement accuracies for the drop sound and LADCP are 0 0.8 and 1.3 sphere groups, respectively. So, using root mean square difference between the cable section transport, which represents the total error, and the drop sound and LADCP measurement errors, they obtained uh, the cable measurement errors of 1.7 and 1.8 uh, sphere groups for the drop sound and LADCP sections, respectively. Since that time, more drop sound and LADCP sections have been carried out. So using all additional sections, we updated the cable measurement error, which now becomes 1.5 um, sphere groups. And this is, it is the same, for, uh, the same for comparing the cable to drop sound or to LADCP measurements. So now the accuracy of the altimetry-derived transport can be estimated as the square root of the difference between the total error squared and the cable error squared, where the total error uh, is the root mean square uh, difference between uh, the cable and altimetry-derived transport, and it is equal to uh, 2.6 square root. So using the updated accuracy of the cable transport, uh, we arrive to uh, one. 2.1 sphere groups for the accuracy of the altimetry transport. So one may say that the cable and altimetry derived transport are not fully independent. And therefore, we also performed an alternative estimation of the altimetry transport accuracy. And for this, we validated altimetry transport with fully independent transport estimated from ship sections. As I mentioned earlier, satellite flies over the Florida Strait or over the Florida current in about a minute while a drop sound and LADCP sections take approximately 6 and 12 hours, respectively. So in order to collocate uh, altimetry-derived transports with the direct in situ measurements, we searched for ship sections that were conducted within plus minus 48-hour windows around the satellite overpass hour. And uh, in 2000, from 2001 to 2019, we obtained 32 drop sound and 30 LADCP sections. Uh, the scatter plots over here show how these section transports are related to the cable and altimetry derived transports. The scatter is somewhat tighter for uh, uh, the drop sound sections. And the RMS difference between the altimetry and section transport can now be uh, regarded as the total error which is uh, 
the square root of the sum of the altimetry transport error squared, uh, the section transport error squared, and the collocation error squared. Uh, collocation is delta. Uh, the collocation error can be derived from daily table transport, and it is 1.6 square root. So now knowing the total error, the collocation error, and the section transport errors, here we can obtain the altimetry uh, transport accuracy, and it becomes uh, two sphere groups when compared to drop zone sections, and 1.9 sphere groups when compared to LADCP sections. So uh, these estimates, as you see, are very close to the error obtained by comparing just cable and altimetry derived transports. So next, for validating the altimetry-derived transports, we also investigated how well the altimetry-derived transport reproduces the variability of the cable transport. And to account for possible non-stationarity of the signals, a magnitude-squared uh, wavelet coherence between cable and altimetry-derived transport is shown here in a time uh, period plane. Uh, so for computing the wavelet co coherence, the altimetry-derived transport was linearly interpolated to daily resolution to match the cable-derived transport. And in order to avoid parts of the cable record with long data gaps, only the period from 2005 to uh, 2020 was considered, uh, during which linear interpolation was used to fill in shorter data gaps. The phase of the wavelet Cross spectrum values was also computed to identify the relative lag uh, between the input signals and the direction of the errors in the coherence plot. Coherence plot corresponds to the phase lag in on the unit circle uh, with the forward direction indicating an unphased relationship. So you can see that there is a reasonable um, in phase relationship between the two transport estimates at almost all resolved scales. Uh, there are high coherence uh, values at periods from 4 to 12 months, which includes the seasonal cycle. It, does, it is also remarkable, um, um, it's remarkable uh, that there are many high frequency signals with periods ranging from 20 days to 4 months, as well as interannual signals that are also well captured by satellite altimetry. However, uh, there are relatively large patches of uh, low coherence at periods uh, shorter than six uh, months, and also uh, in 2005, 2011 at period, at interannual periods. So for a more detailed comparison of the individual timescales of the variability, we reconstructed the Florida current volume transport anomalies by inverting the continuous wavelet transforms of the cable and altimetry derived transports over the range of periods associated with the following uh, signals. So the seasonal cycle obtained by summing up the annual and semi-annual um, harmonics, uh, the intra-seasonal variability, and the interannual variability. So the result is shown in these plots. Uh, with the cable uh, transport shown by black and altimetry transport shown by red curves. And because the intra-seasonal uh, uh, variability is the largest signal in the Florida current transport, the root mean square difference between the cable and altimetry derived transports in this time scale is also larger than for the seasonal and interannual time scales, and it's, it equals to 1.8 square root. Um, the seasonal cycle of the Florida current transport has been investigated earlier, and it has been shown that the amplitude of the seasonal cycle is about two sphere groups, the transports being stronger in summer and weaker in fall. Uh, earlier, Beringer and uh, uh, Larson and later Minan and colleagues also showed that the seasonal cycle present in the cable data is different for different periods. Excuse me. Uh, in particular, in the 90s, when uh, the seasonal cycle exhibited uh, a stronger semi-annual uh, component. However, uh, Minan and Coatus uh, noted that this difference is statistically insignificant due to the shortness of the time series. 
Since now we also have transport estimates derived from satellite altimetry, and given that altimetry has been providing a homogeneous in terms of quality data records since 1993, we can compare the seasonal cycle obtained from altimetry with that obtained from the cable measurements. And when we do that, we see that the altimetry derived uh, seasonal cycle is not significantly different from the cable seasonal cycle obtained for the entire record. Even in 1993-1998, when the cable data was uh, uh, not that great, the altimetry seasonal cycle is similar to the cable seasonal cycle during the periods when the cable measurements were the most accurate. And this suggests that the differences in the seasonal cycle we see in the cable measurements in the 90s are probably due to data quality. So one needs to exercise caution when trying to interpret it. Now let's look at the interannual variability. And here you see the yearly averages of the Florida current transport derived from the cable and altimetry measurements. The interannual variability of the cable transport is reasonably uh, captured by altimetry, but only starting from 2004. Uh, comparison between the cable and alt altimetry derived estimates is quite poor in uh, earlier years. And uh, although the differences are still within the error bars in 1993-1996. Uh, the observed differences in these years can be due to the cable data quality or due to processes that are not reflected in, uh, in CCTS height. So with regard to the longer term variability, the cable transport time series from 1980 to the present show a small but statistically significant trend of minus 0.3 square drops per decade. Uh, the shorter altimetry record time series from 1993 to present also show a negative trend of minus 0.2 square roots per decade, which is, however, not statistically significant. And when we look at the trend from directly measured transport from calibration cruises, it is rather, it is very small and insignificant positive trend of 0.1 square roots per decade. However, it should be noted that transport obtained from cruises is biased towards uh, good weather days, uh, just because we cannot uh, conduct cruises when the weather is not favorable and extreme transports uh, occur during, usually occur during bad weather. So one of the most important advantages of satellite altimetry over in situ instrumentation is that it is not prone to damage from severe weather. Uh, extreme weather events such as tropical storms or hurricanes can damage or destroy in situ instruments. And although the near surface instrumentation is the most vulnerable, for example, tight gauges, the Florida current cable records have also been affected through damages um, that were inflicted on coastal infrastructure, uh, that is the cable voltage recording system. And severe weather is often associated with very strong anomalies in the Florida current volume transport, which can pass unrecorded if the in-situ instrumentation is damaged. So um, it's also, uh, as I mentioned, that when weather is unfavorable, it's not feasible to carry out any ship sections. And therefore, it is of particular importance and interest um, to explore to what extent satellite altimetry could substitute for the cable and ship measurements during extreme weather events. So the, the record minimum of Florida current volume transport uh, was uh, observed, measured by the cable on September 4th, 2019, and it was 17.1 square drops. It was during uh, when Hurricane Dorian was hovering for a few days over the northern uh, Bahamas, Bahama Islands. And uh, while there was a huge devastation on land, uh, fortunately for observations, there was neither damage to the building house in the cable voltage recording equipment, nor a power outage that would stop the recording. Uh, the previous record minimum Florida current transport of 17.2 square was also measured during hurricane. It was Hurricane Sandy that passed uh, uh, the, the Bahamas Islands on October 28th. 2012. Uh, however, it should be noted that given the accuracy of cable estimates of 1.5 sphere drops, the difference between uh, uh, the transports uh, measured during these hurricanes is not significant. 
So these plots over here show the cable and altimetry derived transport as well as sea surface height uh, profiles during the days around satellite uh, overpasses. Uh, sorry, during the days uh, around the passage of these hurricanes near the Florida Straits, and you see that uh, satellite altimetry uh, was able uh, to capture major tendencies associated with the passage of the hurricanes. Uh, the strong decrease of the Florida current transport was associated with flattening uh, of the long track sea level slope. Another a uh, very strong reduction in the Florida current transport from about 40 swerves to nearly 20 swerves was observed during Hurricane Matthew in 2016. What is interesting to note is that all these record minima, uh, for, uh, minima transports of the Florida current were observed during hurricanes that traveled along uh, the U.S. east coast northward and passed over the Bahamas, generating hurricane force northerly north northeasterly winds over the Florida Straits. So let's see what happened right after the passage of Hurricane Dorian in more detail. Um, the record minimum Florida current transport caused by Dorian was measured on September 4th. And luckily, JSON-3 flew along track 178 in the Florida Straits on the next day, September 5th, 2019. And the sea surface height profile on this uh, day is shown by the red curve, and you can compare it to the time mean sea surface height uh, profile shown by the blue curve. You see how uh, the sea level slope flattened and derived segments um, that suggest the occurrence of southward flow. So on September 6, uh, the sea state allowed us to do a drop zone XBT cruise. And shown in these plots is the vertically integrated uh, velocity obtained from drop zone measurements at nine stations along 27 north line, and the vertical profile of geostrophic velocity across the section. So by comparing it to the time mean meridional velocity profile, you can see that the core um, of the Florida current shifted eastward and the southward flow um, was observed along Florida East Coast. So finally, to uh, summarize and conclude, uh, uh, we can say that altimetry-based estimates of the Florida current volume transport roughly capture 60% uh, of the total variability observed by the cable. And the unexplained uh, Variance is mostly due to uh, misrepresentation of intraseasonal in the interannual signals. And this probably results from the lack of vertical coherence of the flow. Uh, this is, uh, still needs to be investigated in more details. Uh, the accuracy of the altimetry based transport estimates is 2.1 square groups, that's the conservative uh, estimate, uh, which is based on the comparison with the cable as well as with uh, drop zone and LDCP section based estimates. And in order to better quantify the estimates of the accuracy of the altimetry-based transport, we have already started to carry out ship sections during the days of satellite overpasses. Of course, that depends on the weather. If the weather permits, we, we try to do that. And I've shown that altimetry-based estimates reasonably reproduce the seasonal, intra-seasonal, and interannual variability of the Florida current volume transport, and sometimes they can be useful for uh, detecting changes associated with uh, extreme uh, weather events, if there is a so satellite overpass during this time. So um, just to list the advantages of using the uh, satellite altimetry data. So first of all, it is gap-free and homogeneous quality record uh, since uh, uh, 1993. Uh, satellite altimetry boasts uh, robust uh, mission planning with detailed launch schedule for instrument replacement. And most importantly, it's not prone to damage from severe weather. And it also provides better special coverage compared to in situ pressure gauges. And uh, uh, using altimetry data, we can uh, derive near real time estimates of the Florida current transport. On the other hand, the disadvantages, of course, the major disadvantage is that satellite altimetry has a limited temporal resolution. That leads to potential aliasing of high frequency signals, and it doesn't account for the full variability. 
And compared to the table, of course, it provides uh, a shorter uh, record. So finally, uh, the final conclusion is that accounting for the platform specific limitations, satellite altimetry can serve as a limited but useful cable replacement. replacement. Nevertheless, uh, the cost-effective cable measurements as well as sustained drop zone, LEDCP and hydrography sections remain vital for monitoring the Florida current. So uh, this data, the satellite derived uh, uh, Florida current volume transport, they are uh, available from uh, the website, uh, NOAML Western Boundary Time Series website. And with this, uh, I thank you for your attention and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, so I see that Sinki has already asked a question in the chat. So Sinki, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Hello, Dennis, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, so I have a several questions, Dennis, a very nice work. But I, I guess the most important question to me is that, um, uh, so the satellite derived transport, you're basically using the geostrophy equation. And I'm wondering if your estimate uh, also contains the vitotropic components. Here, when I say vitotropic, I'm talking about the uh, ocean current at the sea floor. Yeah, thank you for your question, Sanki. Yes, it, uh, it includes uh, everything, actually. So this is a set, what we can get from satellite, the surface geostrophic velocity. But it has the baroclinic and barotropic components. Did, did, I did, huh? did I answer your question? Yeah, okay, okay. Um, but you, you're, you're saying that you're, you're only getting the surface current? Surface components of the geostrophic flow? Yes. So you're, 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 to, to a certain extent, you're actually using some sort of correlation to, to get the entire transport, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Basically, I do, I do not even compute the geostrophic flow. What I do, I just uh, use the sea surface height differences between two segments along the track. Uh, okay. But they are, of course, equivalent to surface uh, geostrophic velocity. And then the assumption mm -hmm behind that is that the surface geostrophic velocity is representative for the uh, total volume transport. Mm -hmm. is, it, is this, do you think you can use this same uh, analysis for different area of the world ocean? Like a, like a Yucatan channel, for instance? Well, theoretically this is possible, but then we need to have some kind of uh, reference, right? Like in the Florida Straits, we have a really long uh, cable record to which we can calibrate. Yeah, you cut the channel transport. I think we have some direct measurement for two, two, three years from the from the Mexican sciences. That also, you know, that also really depends on the region because in the Florida Straits, as I showed, so the Florida current basically fills the entire strait. So it's a, uh, it's you know, it's essentially the tran northward transport across the entire, uh, the entire channel. Uh, while when you have some recirculations, that might be a little bit more complicated. Okay. I see that uh, Matthew Lehenath posted that the Yucatan channel is not well oriented with respect to the satellite tracks. That's so a, that might be. Something yeah, that's a good point, Matthew. That's right. Okay. I Great. see that uh, that uh, Rick has a question for you, Dennis. Yeah, a, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, going back to this most recent point, it'd be interesting, even if there's a track that was south of the Yucatan, but like connecting between Cuba and Mexico, it might be interesting to see, because you're looking at kind of upstream variations of transport compared to the Florida current, how the time series uh, derived by this methodology would compare to the time series that you derived in the Florida current. and. Uh, you know, maybe give you additional information uh, when you take that lead time into consideration for the Florida current transport as well. That could could be an interesting thing to look at. Um, 
I was wondering if you could just make some comments about the errors in the altimetry fields very near uh, land, because I know that the, the errors can get quite a bit larger there. I know that there, are, like Avisa was working on some experimental products that were supposed to be uh, good closer to the um, to, to shore, uh, how those might Im impact your results. And then finally, if you could speculate on future missions um, like SWAT and how that might affect the ability to calculate transports. Thanks, Dennis. Great yeah. seminar. Th thank you, Rick. So yeah, this is a good point about the uh, the proximity of land to uh, satellite tracks. And uh, yeah, so on this slide. So basically, as you see, um, only track 243 approaches the land closer than everything else within the region. But even here, the distance is uh, uh, greater than 10 kilometers. So uh, the influence of land is not that strong here. So it's, it is probably negligible. But anyways, you know, I'm not using track 243 for the reasons that it's not completely, uh, it doesn't completely cross the Florida current. Only track 178 is used. And all the points used along the track are well uh, far away from, from land. Okay, thanks. So regarding your second question uh, about uh, the future perspectives, you are completely right. So. Uh, some of you may know that uh, last year, last fall, uh, Sentinel-6 uh, Michael Freilich satellite was launched, and it is following the same uh, tracks as Topics Poseidon and Jason satellite series. And I and several colleagues in the division are also part of the Sentinel-6 uh, validation team. So we are going, we are planning to look at this uh, new data, I believe soon and try to compare it to uh, previous records and how well uh, the new satellite uh, can be how well the new satellite reproduces the Florida current variability so for the SWOT um, there is I think uh, definitely there, there are a lot of expectations that SWOT uh, can be very useful because uh, it's a uh, uh, spatial resolution will be much improved. On the other hand, uh, uh, so uh, since we are already using a long track data, which uh, has a rel relatively good spatial resolution of 6.2 kilometers, and we still apply some averaging of the segments, which give us the best result. So it's still hard to say, you know, whether SWOT will give a significant improvement or not. But maybe. Maybe by using SWOT, we could use uh, uh, sections that will be more perpendicular to the Florida current uh, flow rather than using these uh, tracks from JSON uh, tracks that are uh, more or less diagonal to the flow. Dennis, I see that you have a question from Gustavo and then Shenfu, and then if time permits, from Shen. So Gustavo, please go ahead. I think I saw a message that he that. dropped out. Oh, okay. Um, if he can rejoin us, then we'll ask him to ask his question. But if not, uh, please go ahead, Shenfu. Um, I, I can read her question. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah, you can read her question and then she can. Okay, I just unmuted myself. So, um, so what I understood is that you use the fixed segment uh, for the SSH difference. That's correct. Proxy. Um, yeah, I'm just asking whether you have tried to use time varying segment because SSH contour probably changing every time. So, um, whether yeah. that can improve the proxy. No, 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 we, we didn't try to do that. And uh, I think uh, that's kind of, so using the fixed segments is based on the best correlations we get. So while I understand what you mean that uh, the Florida current jet may uh, shift from west to east, 
Yes. But I still expect because uh, uh, track 178 basically crosses the entire uh, jet. So I still expect it to be reflected in uh, this long track uh, differences. Yeah, I, I, what I mean is that is um, like the current maybe contract is banned. You, you know, you, you could take a, a bigger segment to approximate the transport for some time, but then there are other times maybe, you know, the current is more contracted and you could use a smaller section. Yeah, that's something you can probably think about uh, for the future analysis. Although it's kind of, uh, I see it as a more unsophisticated because you really need to look track by track what happens. Yeah, but yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you, Shinko. Thank you. So, Shen, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dennis, for your very nice and thorough presentation. I was interested in your estimates of the linear trend for the transports mm -hmm. based on three different estimates, the cable-derived one, the altimeter-derived one, and then you had, uh, I guess, a sheet-based derived one. Mm -hmm. And I think you showed that only the cable-derived linear trend was significant, according to your uncertainties. Does that calculation of the uncertainty on the trend take into account the time varying error in the cable derived estimate? No, it doesn't. Okay, because I'm wondering if you would want to take that into account because when the error changes as a function of time, it affects the uncertainty quantification for trend estimates. That's right, um, yeah. very good point. So it could change. All right, thanks. Thank you, Sean. So is there, are there any other questions from the audience? I do have one question that I was curious about, Dennis, is if you thought, given that you have such a rich data set from the cruises of temperature profiles, have you thought about using this to estimate the heat transport by the Florida current and comparing that with the, the cruise estimates? Uh, temperature transport from using just cruises or? If you, if you could build maybe lookup tables, you know, of how altimetry relates to temperature in the region, I don't know if that would work or not, and then use that to estimate uh, heat transport. From altimetry? Yes. Uh, no, we haven't gone, gone to that point, reached that point yet. <laughs> but what we, actually the next uh, plan is to, uh, see how the pressure, dif uh, how the sea level differences we observe, how they are related to uh, flows throughout, uh, to the Florida current flow throughout the entire column. So we have the section transports from LADCP. So we have the profiles. And we also have pressure gauges, right? So daily, with daily data. And then we can correlate how these differences are related to flows uh, at different you know, depth levels and also um, across the section. Because uh, uh, the hypothesis is that sea level is representative only for the uh, flow above the thermocline. And that it doesn't actually capture what's going on uh, below that. And that's why uh, the explained variance is only 60% at maximum. So, but uh, yeah, so maybe from that point, we'll see if we can uh, go further and look at uh, temperature transports. Thank you. I see that uh, Rick also chimed in that satellite SST might also be useful for that. Um, uh, that's right. That's that, that analysis. So uh, we're almost up on time, but I see Kandaga has one question. So Kandaga, you get the last question of the session. Uh, you're muted. Hi, hi uh, yeah, I, uh, a very nice talk, Dennis. Thanks. Um, I wonder what caused um, low coherence between the um, satellite transport estimates and cable observations um, for intraseasonal variations, say in 2006 
um, 14 and so on. Um, yeah. So uh, it's possible that there are some edge effects because uh, you know the quality of cable data before 2005 was not that good. Mm -hmm. That's one possibility, but it's just you know it's a speculation. Mm. So, but uh, especially you know especially uh, for in in the renal, uh, signals, there might be some some effect what? of those. And um, if time is still available, what what caused the time lags between those two um, the mechanisms explaining the lags? say uh, for intraseasonal time scales on um, six month period we, you could see that there is a lag between those two uh, in 2019 so um, that's the period when we expect the, th those two you know correspond really well right no, it's not uh, it's hardly seen right this lag they're more or less oh, uh, significant? yeah so i didn't even uh, all right i don't think if it's significant or not Hmm. But you know all these arrows they are pretty much uh, directed to the right, which means everything happens in phase more or less. Okay. Okay, I just want to take a moment to thank Dennis for the excellent presentation and thank everybody for joining us. And you get a luxurious two minutes before you run to your next meeting. Enjoy. Thank you very much everybody. Dennis, do you need any help with um, closing out the meeting? Uh, so uh, I think I just need to click on recording again, right? I think I think yeah, you just click on recording again, and then when you I think when you start exiting, it will start.